This film is about a giant leap in the development of welding machines. It's about the world's first welding machines to utilize invert technique. This is how Paucom the legend came to be. Towards the end of the 1800s, the impact of industrialism's progress was noticeable around the globe. The need to fasten metal with greater holding capabilities increased. The major driving force behind this was, for example, the growing shipyard industry, where it was becoming critical to find a more adhesive solution than the current riveting techniques. Just prior to the turn of the century, arc welding, or electric welding as it is also called, was invented. The generators used at this stage weighed close to a metric ton. The move to alternating current electricity in 1919 meant smaller transformers, but that still weighed 300 kilos and required an enormous amount of space. It was an air motor and a generator from Alsa's room. And they weighed about 500 kilos a stick and the engine was on a grusväg så var det tungt att skiva för två mannen, sa han. Around 1970, I was working for ASEA, it's today ABB, and I was very much involved in a lot of very interesting projects. One is this one, the industrial robot, which I was a major player in. Uh, during that time, I was very much involved in power semiconductors to convert electrical power from 50 Hz to DC or other frequencies. I was uh, curious, why don't people use inverter technology in welding machines? So uh, that's one thing I was thinking about several years. And one, one day I came to a decision to try. The difference was that from 400 to 500 kilos kom du ner till en grej som vägde 30 kilo som du hade på en ram och så på en axel och så kunde du klättra på stegen och ha den svetsmaskin med upp. Inverted technology means that uh, you convert uh, one line frequency of 50 to 60 hertz to a high frequency. Uh, now there's a rule that tells say that uh, a transformer's weight is uh, inversely proportional to the frequency. So if you increase the frequency from 50 hertz, for instance, to 5000 hertz, you can re reduce the weight by about 100 times. That means a transformer for a welding machine could be reduced from 400 to 40 kilos, or even less. One day, the idea of combining uh, inverter technology with welding grew until we, I decided to make a test. And that test is done in a garage in Västerås, Sweden. And this is the test equipment where, where we made the first inverter for test welding. And it did work. It, it could also run full power, three, four hundred amps or something, but maybe for 15 seconds or something like that, because this was very small. And the, the first arc was struck in this small thing. Here you can see it's burned. So, but unfortunately, the transformer is gone. I, uh, I borrowed it to my former partner, John Hedberg. Unfortunately, he died and uh, we couldn't find the, the transformer. Very difficult to do it with just two hands in the garage. Uh, so I had the help by my son that was about three years old at that time. So we together made the transformer. It's a very good transformer. No transformer ever after has tested so good electrically. But it was cold, it's winter. So we worked 
with the snow boots uh, in the garage uh, during the winter to make this, this test equipment. It proved the circuitry and it proved it, it did well and so forth. Okay, let's change the generation. We move this up here. This is one of the three prototypes we made, original design. And uh, the design is made by my brother. It's a little bit more square than it became later on. And, uh, this is an empty box and it shows the design that we switched over to. And we used then uh, the industrial designers that helped me with the industrial robots at one time. So it's the same people that uh, helped us at ASEA or IBB that helped us to convert this design to this design. Interior, it's the same. So I tried for about half a year ago to, to weld with it. It just said bang. <laughs> Managed to repair the card. It got an arc for maybe 10 seconds or so <laughs> and then blow up. <laughs> And it's very difficult to get a hold of things that was manufactured 50 years ago. But I managed to get it to work. Now we have three working prototypes. What we need now is financing to get the business going on. And uh, we were successful and got uh, uh, fairly good financing from the Swedish investment bank. And they printed also, they, th they thought this is investment was very good. So they printed up this one. And they said it's, it's a world sensation welding machine. So then we started Svetsia, which was supposed to continue to develop the product and manufacture and market, mainly market the, the product. Uh, and that was, went fairly well. We sold quite a few already from the early days because of the, it had good welding properties and so forth. And also was a sensation because of the weight. But we need, needed even more money to increase the production. The investment bank told us that, oh, 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 you need an agreement with some other big company. And then we're going to, to give you uh, additional fundings for, for getting this business bigger. Okay, we understood that we had to sign an agreement with a bigger company. But we also at the same time understood that it's very dangerous for us being a small company, less than 10 persons employed. Uh, to work together with a big company, so we was looking for an exit uh, all from the beginning. The cooperation with the big company went quite well in the beginning, and suddenly we had problems. So the exit we have thought about had to be used. In 1979, the company Svetia AB was sold to Pacific Lumber. The organization moves to the affiliate company Thermal Dynamics in New Hampshire. So everything was then moved to Thermal Dynamics in New Hampshire. Of course, they wanted to change the name. Uh, of course, they wanted to change things because they were the new owner. So they called it Popac instead of Pocon. But that did last only for a few years. And then they changed it back to Pocon. And I remained in, in the business uh, on a consultant basis for a few years until 1982 when I left Pocon business uh, totally. But uh, in the meantime, um, before 1982, uh, I participated in, in a, a project where we moved the, the business from, uh, from New Hampshire to uh, 
Phoenix, Arizona. The parent company wanted to give Palcon more status, so they decided to give Palcon its own factory in Phoenix, Arizona, which was considered more prestigious. So we started up uh, the, the whole business in Tempe outside of Phoenix. When I left uh, uh, Paucon in, in Tempe, uh, my partner John Hedberg remained in the business for uh, as long as it was located in Tempe. Following 1982, the company changed owners several times, which resulted in the final owner, Illinois Toolworks, shutting down production of Palcon during 1998. But anyway, John Hedberg uh, knew the technology and uh, met uh, a friend, Gunnar Enefelt, and uh, together they did started uh, the manufacturing with the same technology, the same circuit diagram, the same thing, but different casing and a different name. Partner John Hedberg managed to convince the Ennerfelt family in Salisbury, Maryland, to manufacture a near identical version of Palcon, which now lives under the name Workhorse. Nowhere seen uh, the Palcon story of Palcon came to be about 50 years ago, and uh, that this product is still uh, working out in the field and is still produced is probably because of it's a very robust product, both mechanically and electrically. Unfortunately, uh, it has had a very turbulent existence over the 50 years, and uh, that is uh, I think mainly due to the fact that we could not finance uh, the, the project properly like we can do today with the venture capital. Venture capital maybe was available at that time, but not developed the way it is today. But still, at the, at the end, I'm very proud to have developed this product and made it work. And I'm also very glad to have saved one of the three prototypes that is working today. Mm -hmm.